and welcome back to Overbooked. I'm Amanda and today we're gonna be doing my February wrap up. So for February I didn't read as much as I think I wanted to or I expected I would, um, but that's okay. I think I'm feeling like really motivated in March, at least these first couple days, so I'm hoping that I will make up some ground. There's just so many books that I want to read. Like I don't know about you guys, but like as like a booktuber and somebody who's always on bookstagram like i always am just seeing more and more books i'm like i can't keep up i have a growing list and i haven't even made a dent i don't know how you guys do it i don't know how you handle it sometimes i just don't watch booktube videos for a couple weeks because i'm like i can't i can't because i can't add another book to my goodreads list you guys are too good you're too good i just can't but what i can do is tell you what i actually read and hopefully you aren't taking a break from booktube videos and I'm watching my video. Subscribe. Let's just dive in and let's talk about these books. The first book that I read or I finished for February was The Far Field by Mahari Vijay and I have a whole book review that I did for this for the Reading Women Challenge so I will link that down below and I'll try to keep this very brief. The Far Field is like a contemporary literature book that takes place in India and is about a woman who just experienced the loss of her mother and is trying to come to terms with it and trying to figure out how she moves on or like how she continues her life without her mother, without that presence there. Um, and she decides that she's gonna go on this journey um, to find this man who was like a clothes salesman who would come to their home. And he seemed to be her mother's like true, only true friend, the only person that seemed to understand her. And so she starts this like journey and thing in her life where she goes and she tries to find this person and tries to like work through her grief and through what she's experiencing on this trip. I enjoyed it. It was very slow pace and very like, I feel like there wasn't a ton of happening, but there was, but it was just kind of like, we didn't get to really see it. Like, because we only got our main character's perspective and she just kind of, it's mainly just about her and her talking. And it's a lot of like her with just thoughts in her head. Like she's, a, she's like in her head a lot and she's thinking a lot. And that's kind of what we get out of the book. It was good, it was fascinating, it was excellent writing. The descriptions were beautiful. Um, I thought it was a little, just just too slow and whatnot. I read the audiobook and I thought that was like its redeeming quality for me just because the narrator was really great and I really felt like I understood what was going on through her. So if you guys haven't really heard much about The Far Field, check out my review below, I will link it there. The next book I finished was Magic Hour by Kristen Hanna which I know is not the book that we want to talk about by Chris and Hannah right now, because what is it? Prairie, The Four Winds, something, something. But I really want to read and I'm on hold at the library, I'm like number 182, so <laughs> it'll be a bit. But I read The Magic Hour by Chris and Hannah because a friend recommended, recommended it to me. Shout out to Maria. She watches my channel sometimes. Hi, girl. So I read The Magic Hour based on her suggestion, and I'm very, very sorry, Maria. I just didn't like it. It wasn't for me. I felt like this book, well, let's talk about what it's about. So this book is about uh, two sisters, so kind of Nightingale-esque. One is like a child psychiatrist or counselor. I don't really exactly know, remember the term. And she's under a lot of fire um, recently because one of her patients was a person who like did a school shooting. I don't know what the word would be for that. Not victim, because she's the one who did it. So she's under a lot of fire for not realizing that her patient had issues or was like about to do this and she couldn't stop it. Um, and then we also see her sister who is in this like small town, which we hear about a million freaking times that it's a small town. So she's a, uh, a sheriff or police officer in a small town and all of a sudden this child shows up who is nonverbal, seems to be kind of like a wild child. Um, she acts like a like an animal essentially, like she doesn't talk, whatnot. She's very young. I think they think that she's like four or something. So uh, her the police officer's sister uh, calls for her psychiatrist sister to come help her and help uh, figure out what's going on with this child and um, help her figure out like where she came from and who she belongs to. And so the whole story is kind of about that. And then also just like the sisters grappling with like what's going on in their lives. I thought it was interesting and like, I felt like it wasn't super, like it wasn't super slow pace, I guess. So there was always something happening, but I felt like it kind of dragged out a lot. Like I was kind of like, 
very similar to The Great Alone, I guess, by the Chris and Hannah. It's like where I was kind of like, okay, near the end, like I just wanted to get it over with. I also felt like there was a lot of like fat phobia and homophobia throughout this book. So like trigger warnings, I guess, for those who, you know, are going through um, or want to watch out for those kind of things in a book. It just didn't seem, it just left a bad taste in my mouth. It wasn't like blatant and obvious, but it was just kind of like, a little bit too much. Um, this book was written in like 2006 or 2008 or something, so it's been a bit, but there's better books, I think, that could represent that kind of error in a better light. Overall, I thought it was like fine to like to read. If you like Kristen Hanna and can't get your hands on her newest book like I can't, I would suggest you check it out and see for yourself if you would like it. So the next book I read was the... Mermaid of Black Conch, and that's by Monique Rafi. And I read this for the Book of Sense book club, which I unfortunately was not be able to join this month. I am gonna do my best to join it for March. And I still haven't gotten the book for March. I was poor planning and had a homework assignment due the same week and I was not prepared. I did not get to join, but I read the book and I enjoyed it. It's something I don't think I've ever read. I don't really read a lot of like fantasy kind of. Um, I don't really read a lot about uh, mermaids. I thought it was, um, so the story is about a fisherman who discovers a mermaid and then she is caught by some other fishermen and then our main character saves her from them because they're gonna like auction her off or sell her. Um, and then he essentially like has her, you know, saves her and has her in his home. So, but once she's like saved, he like, he plans on like putting her back into the ocean where he thinks she belongs, but she starts transforming back into a woman. And so there's this whole like, what do we do now? What is, what's the protocol for a mermaid in my house? And the fisherman and the mermaid kind of start to fall in love. So their story and the whole community story here. And this takes place in a like Caribbean island. So there's like hurricanes going on and they coincide with like the events that are going on with the book. And there's like literary fantasy and magical spells and there's just a lot and I really enjoyed it. It wasn't my favorite book. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I was going to, uh, but I really wish I would have gotten, was able to go to the book club discussion because I think I would have gotten a lot more out of this book if I was able to go. But I thought that it was a great, great, um, exposure to this area and to these people and I think that if you're really into fantasy and mermaids and just magic I think it's a fun interesting book to read so I recommend. So the next book I read or I finished was Hood Feminism Notes from the Women That a Movement for Forgot by Mickey Kendall and wow I think this should be a book that everyone should have to read it's just very very just like thought-provoking, very just like informative and very like just not talk, not baby talking to, you know, the white feminist. Like this is what's going on and like we're not sorry about it, but you need to do something about it. There are so many good points brought up in this book and I just think that, you know, as a feminist myself and as a white female, I think it was very important for me to read this and acknowledge that a movement that has been so crucial for like my opportunity that I've had and that I've been given and the like power essentially that I have is a lot of thanks to like the black feminists and the women of color feminists who have done a lot of groundwork for that and then got ignored. Um, so I thought this was just so, just so good and just a lot of great points to like think about and just really dive deep into. My favorite chapter is in this book is called Fear and Feminism. And it mainly kind of just talks about how white feminism is like almost afraid to let anybody else in because they're afraid to like lose their power and there was just so many good points so I, I i highlighted some things i just kind of wanted to read so chapter of fear and feminism out on page 162 if you're all following along mainstream white centered feminism hasn't just failed women of color it has failed white women it's not making them any safer any more powerful or any even any wiser it supports goals of white supremacy so often and so uncritically that 53% of white women voted not just for the idea of a president who has a legacy of disrespecting and abusing women, but for the system that supports him. 
Conditions aren't getting better for white women. In fact, these patterns reflect a return to a paragon where the only difference is that their cage is gilded, while others are entrapped in less decorative combines. So I just thought that was a really good point. It's like, we're not, by, by leaving out people in this movement, we're not making it any better for ourselves. We're just putting us in this better cage and it's still a cage. So, so another thing I wanted to point out, what women are we empowering? But also what are we empowering them to do? White women aren't just passive beneficiaries of racist oppression, they are active participants. White women have long been the bedrock of conservative ideology in America, from Phyllis Schaefer's attack on the Equal Rights Amendment to current anti-abortion pushes. For white mainstream feminism, the arguments are further left politically, but still exclusionary. So I just felt like that was also a really good thing is like to point out is like we're like white women are active participants in taking away these rights, not only from ourselves, but from other people of color. And it's just kind of just this really frustrating thing to see and grapple with. And I think it's something that we all have to come to terms with. It's like, okay, I can say I'm a feminist all day long, but what am I doing to hold my other white women feminists accountable? And I need to start to get better and like question what they're pushing for and who, like who they're trying to and actually empower because Phyllis Shafley, who were you trying to empower? I don't really know. <sighs> okay, got, some, got another one. <laughs> the fear of alienating other white women by refusing to challenge them or deny them support as a consequence for their racism is fundamentally damaging to any concept of feminism as a place that can create safety for all. Like we have to start, like stop having that fear of confronting each other because we're just scared to. Because if we keep having that fear, nothing's gonna change and nothing's gonna get better for anybody. Okay, this is the last thing that I just wanted to point out. While it's easy to point to those white women, all white women are often part of the same communities. Conversations that can largely be summed up as about being national security, the economy, and upholding the standards of their community and religious institutions are tabled in favor of family unity. That means the same aunt who's voting pro-life, anti-LGBTQIA, pro-guns and anti-immigration is spending the holidays prepping side dishes with her more progressive niece who is pro-choice, pro-LGBTQIA, and also refusing and also pro-refusing to do anything to attempt to sway that aunt or the children that aunt is raising. So I thought that was a really, really good point to think about and examine because I feel like, which I also had a further conversation with my other friends who has, we, we just talked about that scenario and how like, we do need to be get better at like, okay, if I know my aunt, we're like washing dishes after Christmas and we're sitting there and she says something blatantly racist or blatantly that's like not true. Or if I know that she's not supporting like feminist issues across the board. And if I don't say anything, what, a, what does that mean for me? Like I'm just as bad as her then in that light. And I think that in those conversations, I think we have to recognize who we can talk to and who is gonna be an actually like um, beneficial dialogue with those people. And I think I've started to have those like thoughts in my head. And there's somebody that I think that I really should have a conversation with and I keep avoiding it because I just don't wanna make them upset. And I think it would actually be a good conversation and um, the fear that I have has been holding me back. And I think that after reading this chapter, I was like, okay, well, I've just been bullshitting around and I really need to just let go of that fear and have that conversation because it's important. And the only thing that I'm benefiting is like my comfort. I'm, I'm just making myself comfortable and I'm not progressing myself and other women and I'm definitely not progressing women of color. So it's just a really interesting, like, it's just really good thought provoking things and they really just land in your face and you're like, I have to do something. And, or I have to start thinking about this. I have to start thinking about not just like what feminist issues relate to me, but what feminist issues relate to all women. Like this, you know, the book talks about housing inequality, you know, food security, like just things that like myself, I don't have to think about on a daily basis, but I should start thinking about because those things affect all women. That was kind of a long, this is probably the longest thing I've, I'm already kind of like over time that I wanna be, but I really think this book is really important. I think it's a very important read. If any of my friends who are watching, who watch these videos, 
Let me know if you want to borrow this book. It's yours to borrow. I want it back though, but I, I want everyone to read this book. And finally, the last book that I read was The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Desha Philia. And this book was so good. So this book is a sh short story collection. Um, it highlights um, black women in the, who are either participating in the church or have family members in the church. Um, kind of just like church stories and um, just their lives and snippets of their things. And it was just amazing. There was, this was actually one of the best short story collection stories I think I read. I think... I liked this better than the Office of Historical Corrections. And that's, that was hard to tap, I'm not gonna lie. But this book was just so good. There's just such a range of stories, a range of perspectives. And it was just amazing. I also really just loved the, um, the queer love representation in these short stories. I read the, like the first story is um, about these two women who are in a relationship but one doesn't think they are. And I was like, oh, this is so great. I'm so glad that it opens up with this, you know, this queer love story. And I was like, well, that's probably gonna be the only one. And it's not, it's surprisingly, pleasantly, surprisingly, it's not. And it was just so great and I just really loved it. I found this book through The Stacks, which another shout out to them. Um, so check her out. Um, I unfortunately this month did not get to The Stacks book club pick, but I'm reading it right now. So hopefully that'll be my March wrap up. And I think that's all on the books. And finally, so to, it is March, it is Women's History Month. And last year I did a whole video and like fundraising thing. It didn't go great. I mean, I raised some money, um, but I did something for the Women's, the Women's Prison Book Project in Minneapolis. And this organization is um, a nonprofit that takes donations and takes um, and gets book collections and donates them to uh, women in prison. And this is also includes uh, trans women and obviously women of color. Um, women make up a kind of a big portion of people in prison and a lot of their offenses are very minor or if they were huge, it was in retaliation to something that happened to them. And I just think that, you know, everybody deserves access to books and deserves access to reading and education. And so I just really like this program. I like really enjoyed discovering it last year. And I will put the video down below um, and you can check out that video. I'll include their website down below and you can learn all about them yourselves. I just think they're really great. So what I wanted to do this year is I'm not gonna do like a fundraising thing. Um, you don't, I'm not gonna encourage you. Well, I do encourage you to donate, but I'm not like gonna, I don't have a fundraising goal. Um, but for every video I do, I want to buy a book on one of their high need lists and I'll link directly to that. They have um, four lists that you can, um, I think it's like four bookstores that they work with that they have a whole list of high level, like high need books that are like very popular or like a lot of um, women are requesting. So um, I'm gonna buy from one of those lists for every video I do. And I haven't bought my book yet, but hopefully by the time this video is edited and uploaded, I will tell you in the description below what book I bought. And I just highly encourage you guys to also, like you don't have to buy a book for obviously every video you do or every video you watch with me, but I encourage you to this month, perhaps buy a book for the project, perhaps making a donation. And if you do, please let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear what book you donated or if you um, just simply checked out the organization, that'd be so cool. And something to note, when I was on the website, they're not looking for a lot of fiction books. They're looking for a lot of nonfiction books. So um, on their high needs list, I am gonna try to just focus on nonfiction books on that list. That is that. Um, if you um, have any other things I should be looking out for or any bookstagrammers or booktubers who are doing anything for Women's History Month, let me know and I would appreciate it. That was my February wrap up. Um, again, in the comments below, let me know if you decided to donate a book, if you checked out the organization and what books you read in February. I wanna hear from you guys. I love when you guys comment on my videos. Um, so let me know what you guys are reading. Like this video if you enjoyed and subscribe if you have not already and I will see you guys next time.